Now I'll ask you to rise as I read the text out of the good news of the Gospel of St. Luke for this day. It's from the third chapter of Luke's Gospel. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This week, you, like me, have probably been paying attention to the news of how we have been told how severe the flu outbreak has been this year here in the United States. Perhaps you didn't need to watch the news to know that. Maybe someone, or even you, or someone you live in your family, had, had to deal with the affliction. That's what happened with our family. On New Year's Day, my younger son Richard called me from his home in Maryland to say he had a temperature of 101, and he was alternately feeling hot, then very cold. And I said, stay home. So he did. Three days later, he talked to me again. He said he felt fine. So he got through it. He knew what to do. Now, of course, he, Richard was very disappointed that he missed our New Year's Day feast which is really good. So I sent leftovers home with his brother. That's probably what helped him recover quicker. I'm sure that was. That and the shoe fly, no doubt. We know what to do if we see the symptoms coming on, right? Stay home, stay hydrated, stay rested, take the right medicine to keep the fever in check. It might be necessary for you to visit your doctor if you're feeling particularly bad and over-the-counter medicines don't seem to be working. But we have been told over and over again what the primary preventative measure is. Get the shot. Millions of us around the country have already done that. I heard a story this week that the flu vaccine this year is about 62 percent effective and we're told that's a good percentage for a vaccine from year to year. Now, the other major preventative measure we can do is to keep ourselves clean, especially our hands, uh, washing our hands regularly. Now, whether this part is true or not, I'm not so sure, but I heard a doctor on the radio uh, say that we should wash our hands for as long as it takes us to sing one chorus of happy birthday. Of course, with the warmest water tolerable, ample amount of soap, and the ability to carry a tune. Well, I added that one. You don't have to. And it makes sense. The use of water as a cleansing agent is a helpful thing to do, not just during the flu season, but of course, any time during the year. Now, doing that as a regular practice does not mean we won't get the flu. It's not a guarantee that we won't get sick, Sometimes I think those viruses have a mind of their own. Well, they are living organisms, aren't they? So I don't, I don't know if they do or not. But they seem to seek us out. But it is something we ought to do along the road we must take to keep ourselves healthy. Simple, common sense stuff. Wash your hands. Well, this morning we're talking about washing, in a way. We gather to remember a very important event as we worship God in thanksgiving for one of the great gifts of divine health, of love and relationship God's given us. And that's the gift of the sacrament of baptism. We are reminded of this gift through today the story St. Luke provides about the baptism of Jesus himself. 
It's kind of interesting. When we get to the point toward the end of the text that I read that actually talks about the baptism, first we hear how Jesus takes his place in line, just like everybody else. No VIP rope line, no bouncer at the entrance to the river, doesn't have a clipboard to admit the worthy and to reject the unworthy. Here before God, everyone is worthy, everyone is admitted. And Jesus takes his place along with everyone else. Now in this way, it's a, it's a subtle thing, but in this way he is establishing before us the DNA he received from his mother. He's one of us participating in a sacramental act meant as a gift for the children of God. But then, of course, there's the more dramatic moment. Following his baptism, Jesus begins to pray. Hmm. That's exactly what we do when, in our baptismal liturgy. But what follows, of course, is the unique statement of God to Jesus by which the divine DNA of Jesus is revealed. You are my son, begins the statement. The beloved, with you I am well pleased. In our liturgy, the newly baptized hears a, a different yet important statement of identification. You belong to Christ, we declare with great confidence. You belong to Christ. Here in these actions, we see clearly that baptism truly is God's act. We're here to help. The water's here to help, but it is the word, or maybe I should say the words of God which are used, which indicate the power of God to join with the baptized forever. It's an act of God's grace that anyone of any age is called and claimed by God once for all time from this act of God, then we go out and embark on our road of life. As the old hymn says, when we come out of that baptism, what a fellowship, what a joy divine. What a joy. What a joy. For it puts us in relationship and brotherhood or sisterhood, not just with God, but with every person that we encounter the rest of our life. In his little devotional book on the church year called Holy Days, Pope Benedict writes that baptism is the divine rainbow in our life. The presence of the great yes of God, the gateway to hope, and the sign that indicates the road we must take in our active and joyous way to meet him and feel loved by him. He's indicating the work of the Holy Spirit, which is also a gift God gives to us through baptism. And we pray that the same Spirit gives us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and the spirit of joy in the presence of God. And we're told when we're baptized, you are my child. We have our divine identity as a child of God marked with the cross of Christ forever. And this is an identity, friends, that is never taken away from us. Today, today we struggle with all sorts of issues related to identity and relationship. We've had our ups and downs in both, probably particularly more in the relationship issue. In a world with distractions, both nearby and around the world, with competing philosophies and positions, at times when we're, feel, when we're feeling pulled in several directions, when we feel like we're going up the rough side of the mountain, we come here. For today in this place, God's sons and daughters gather around the Lord's table confident in the one identity that unites us, the identity as a child of God. St. Luke shows us that all of this is God's doing as the Holy Spirit baptizes Jesus. And because it is God's action, we have confidence that no matter how often we fall short or fail, nothing that we do or fail to do can remove the identity that God has given us in this gift. And we sure have shown God that we are capable of falling short or failing, haven't we? Despite being washed by the water, we are still susceptible to the force of sin that is all around us. We still get the flu virus of sin. But the relation with God as his child is never interrupted or broken. 
We can't screw up that connection because we didn't establish it. We can neglect it. We can run away from it. We can ignore it. We can deny it, but we can't destroy it because God loves us too deeply, too passionately, too completely to ever let us go. All of this comes out of the love and grace of God and God's desire to be close to us. If we were left up to ourselves, we wouldn't be able to believe or sustain our faith during times when we really need to lean on it. Many of us, many of us learned this a long time ago. Go back to confirmation class and remember how Luther explained to us the third article of the creed. I believe that by my own understanding or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but instead, the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel and enlightened me with his gifts, made me holy, and kept me in the true faith. Good words to remember if we ever have an identity crisis. Fortunately, we can be reminded of this eternal gift of God each time we walk by the font of baptism, make the sign of the cross, and remember our baptism. The Spirit of God is lit for all time as we offer our confession and receive God's forgiveness. The divine rainbow connects us each time we come forward to receive Jesus in bread and wine. And we follow a road God prepares for us each time we go out in mission to feed the hungry, each time we clothe the naked, each time we visit the prisoner, each time we pray with the sick. You notice the action here. Not when I do this, but when we do this, this mission. Baptism is the public commitment of the community of God to the baptized and the public affirmation of the community to support each other. At the end of our baptismal liturgy, we declare that the congregation declares, we welcome you into the body of Christ, into the mission that we share. And then we invite the baptized to join us, to join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. It doesn't matter if it's the screaming cry of a baby or the singing of an elderly person our thanks is heard by God. This is the type of family we refer to when we talk about the congregation being a family. In the months down the road from now, when uh, you fill out your congregation profile, I'm sure you're going to use the word family somewhere in that, because everybody does. This is the type of family we're talking about. The family that God calls and gathers together every week. And every day we go out and fulfill our mission of sharing the good news of the one who came up out of the river, baptized just like us, who then went on to live and die and rise and ascend so that we will rise with God and live with him forever. Thanks be to God. Amen.